uh, an all-round nice guy. So, uh, yeah, he's going to be helping David out. So go for it, guys. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's funny you say I'm a famous author. I'm a famous author only because of people on this call who have bought the book. Um, writing a book like Amatora, a history of Japanese fashion, that even my friends were like, why would you write such a niche book on such a niche topic? Uh, you write it and then you hope somebody reads it. And it's been amazing to see um, how many readers there are. Um, also, you know, I've, well, I've worn jeans for a long time. Uh, I'm not, but I wasn't a denim head and I knew nothing about the history of Japanese denim and I kind of had to start from scratch to learn about it. And so uh, that's also been a great experience, just uh, feeling really out of my depth on something and then trying to, to research and, and come up with um, uh, a compelling story that convinced me of, you know, what why it is that Japan became such a leader in denim. Uh, and then being able to publish it and have other people read it. So thanks again. Uh, I'm going to do a presentation uh, from, from most of the call. Um, I'm happy to take questions as I speak. Um, and uh, also we'll have some time at the end, I think, to answer questions as well. So let me share my screen. Um, I need permission to share my screen. Don't have that. While we wait for that, I will show you the, this is the mainland China version of the book, which is now in its third printing. Um, I think it's sold more copies in China now than anywhere else, actually, which is pretty surprising. But the name of the book in uh, mainland China is not Amatora. Um, it is Harajuku Cowboys. Uh, because the word for jeans is cowboy pants. And so they decided for Harajuku Cowboy. I think the lesson there is I should have called it Harajuku Cowboy from the start, because that seems to be the most popular name for the book. So let's see. Nope. I'm going to say that is a cool name. <laughs> so you've sold, you've sold most of the books in China then. That's the uh, biggest place you've sold them. Yeah, so far uh, that seems to be the the number one place. And the other thing that's interesting is the you know the English version is from an American publisher, but I think especially in the first year, um, most of the sales were coming from Europe. It seemed uh, so more in the UK. So when you write a book about America and Japan, you kind of think oh, there's going to be an audience in Japan you know, in America, uh, and then from there it actually was much more popular in the UK, where I think Japanese brands were more popular. All right, I think I can do this now. Okay. Benjamin, can you see the slides? Yeah. Excellent. Okay. So I'm going to do a quick history of jeans in Japan, uh, kind of where, where that whole culture came from and hope to answer any questions related to that at the end. Um, the book Amator, if you don't know, covers um, basically all American traditional styles, which I would consider jeans to be one, and how they came to Japan after the war and how Japanese brands are now making premium versions that have been exported back to uh, the US and the world and are appreciated as the most authentic versions of those garments, um, which is a su relatively surprising chain of events. And so I look at kind of very detailed how exactly that happened and look at the personalities behind it. Um, you see here the US cover, the Japanese cover, and then this is the um, traditional Chinese cover that they sold in Taiwan. Um, so jeans in Japan. So I want to start just, you know, from a personal point of view, I, about 1999 or 2000, I uh, was in New York and I had heard the Japanese denim was the best denim. That, that kind of idea was spreading around even just as a college student, I had heard it. And I went to the 45 RPM store in Soho, which had just opened. And you kind of see here, it almost looks like a Japanese temple. Um, it was very much focused on uh, talking about the tradition of Japanese cotton and indigo dyeing. And you got a sense that, you know, Japanese jeans were really, you know, tied up in Japanese tradition and craftsmanship. Then you look at a brand like uh, Capital, um, and the logo of Capital is the two blue hands of an indigo dyer. And then you've got, you know, a lot of garments kind of using boro and, and traditional Japanese techniques. Um, and then someone like uh, Kaihara Denim, this was something I found on Uniqlo's homepage. 
and you see these kind of ancient shuttle looms. And I think there's an image that Japanese denim making is literally an 85 year old guy, you know, hunched over the world's oldest loom, pushing it, you know, by his hand, getting, you know, one meter of cloth every month. And then that becomes the most premium jeans. Um, I was surprised to go to the, one of the Kaihara factories and it's the most automated robot place I've ever been in my entire life. Um, and so it was quite interesting to me just how much it looked like Japan had this really rich, long history that went back almost to the 8th century or something of making denim. And, you know, one of the surprising facts about Japanese jeans that I learned is that there were no jeans in ancient Japan. And so you kind of have to think about how did we get to a point where even in Japan, people are tying this very American garment back to their own history um, and uh, that, that process is quite interesting and actually quite recent, and so that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, the other thing, Japanese jeans are just kind of one bigger part of the explosion of uh, Japanese youth culture, Japanese fashion culture that's now become super famous everywhere, um, and, and jeans kind of grew up as part of that, and that's what we're going to look at. The other thing that's quite interesting is just uh, Japan doesn't just make the best jeans, it kind of owns the world's best jeans. So just the archiving aspect of Japanese stores, this is a uh, better, better jean in Harajuku in the basement, uh, which is like basically a museum of Levi's 501s, that, but they're on sale. Um, and, you know, if you want, I, my, my understanding is still that if you just want to walk right into a store and buy a, uh, you know, $10,000 pair of pre-war Levi's, the easiest place to do this is in Harajuku. Uh, and then, of course, just, you know, the fashion industry now, when it comes to premium denim, there's an understanding that Japanese brands are some of the best. I think this in the recent years has expanded. It's been quite interesting to see that Japan doesn't have a monopoly on this anymore. But um, certainly in the last 20 years, Japan developed this reputation that wasn't there before. So if you go back to the post-war, I think the way people in their minds think about how jeans must have gotten big in Japan is that you had a bunch of American soldiers show up in 1945. Uh, jeans were a huge part of American culture at this point. And so the idea that all these Americans show up in uh, Japan and they must be wearing jeans and everybody sees jeans and says, cool, I want to wear jeans. Um, but it didn't quite work like that. And actually the spread of American style happened almost about 20 years after the occupation. And it was a much more uh, intensely um, kind of planned and intentional process of brands. And so that's, that's what we'll look at. Um, if you were on the streets during the occupation, you mostly saw um, people in their uniforms. You know, the, the American soldiers were in their uniforms. They weren't necessarily in jeans. You had to go to the bases to see them relaxing in jeans. But one thing that happened was there were black markets that developed. And Amiyoko is still a, a, a shopping area kind of on the east side of Tokyo. It still has a black mar market feel. Some of the best Americana clothing stores are still over there. There's kind of a whole street of them. And Amiyoko is really where the story of jeans starts because uh, what was happening was the prostitutes who serviced American soldiers uh, were being paid by those American soldiers in old clothing because they could get more money for that than they could for necessarily currency. And so these uh, prostitutes called Pan Pan Girls were going to a store uh, called Maruseru. And Maruseru is like a Japanese um, pronunciation of Marseille in France. It was a store that sold soap. And they started buying these, these jeans, these old jeans, and they didn't know what they were at all. Um, but they were this color blue, and blue and cotton pants were very rare at the time, and people seemed to like it. Uh, and they felt like it was the blue of victory, that there was something really kind of, you know, fun and different about these these jeans, but nobody knew what they were. Um, and so the owner came up with a name, which was G Pan, uh, G as in GI and Pan, Pan as in pants. There's an alternative theory that the Pan is from the Pan Pan girls, the name of the prostitutes. Um, but it very much starts this name, G Pan, uh, in the black markets as these weird pants that no one knew what they were. They thought they were prisoner uniforms uh, or something. And uh, the word jeans doesn't really catch on until about 20 years after this. And so in the late 40s, you start to see the sale of black market jeans in Japan uh, and, uh, uh, you know, very much tied to kind of a shady, uh, uh, you know, prostitution and, and, and GIs selling stuff that they're not supposed to. Uh, at the same time, this is a famous photo that kind of became big in the 50s. Um, this is Jiro Shirasu, who's one of the most elite 
Japanese people, especially in the post-war. He worked, you know, as, as part of the treaty process between the U.S. and Japan. He was a big businessman. And here's a photo of him wearing what looks like a incredibly crisp pair of salvage 501s um, that he must have gotten. Uh, there was no way to buy these in Japan unless you went through an American and got it at a PX or something. And so you have this very, very elite person wearing jeans because they're impossible to get. And then also it's being sold in the black market. And so it has a kind of dual, uh, very covetable good, but at the same time, a, a little bit, um, uh, you know, risque black market feel to it as well. Uh, from there, you start getting, uh, you know, more sales in the black market. And then also, as there's demand for these jeans, what the uh, black marketeers realize is that Americans are sending packages to their family in Japan, and they're packing stuff with old jeans. And so they're getting these scraps of jeans, they're uh, sewing them all together to make these like weird Frankenstein pairs just to get jeans because there's high demand for them. But, you know, at this point, you can't have a culture of jeans if literally there's only, you know, 10 pairs on sale a month or something. Uh, and so in the late 50s, finally, Japan relaxes the importation uh, restrictions. And you get the first importation of a big bulk of used jeans from, I think, Seattle. Uh, and then from there, they start being able to import uh, Levi's and Lee and all, all those brands. The one problem, though, is can you, you can see from this photo from the 60s is that they're, you know, unwashed, raw really kind of rock hard uh, denim. And everyone at that point was used to denim being really soft and old. And so everyone didn't really like these jeans and didn't quite understand these new jeans. At the same time, they're not part of the fashion complex at all. You had to know where to buy them, even if they were sold in Namayoko. So there's, you, you see some importation, but there's really not a culture of it yet. The other thing to understand at this point is if you think about jeans as being youth culture, that even in the 50s, uh, and after the war, if you were a high school student or a college student, you were wearing a gakuran, which is a, a, a uniform in wool with a high collar. It's like a Prussian collar, black uniform. I think in Italy, they actually wore these at, at schools as well. And, um, you know, youth had to be wearing these. And if youth were not wearing those, they were basically considered delinquent. So anyone who was there to wear jeans as a young person uh, looked a little bit delinquent. And so that black market you know, reputation still lingered. Things start to change with youth culture, at least about 1964, you have the Olympics, and there's a brand called Van Jacket that imports Ivy League style to Japan, um, kind of from scratch. And so by, you know, 65, you start seeing young people dressing like this. They're dressing in this very, like, buttoned up, three-button uh, Ivy look got really big. There was a magazine called Men's Club that became kind of the Bible of men's fashion that taught people how to dress like an American style. Jeans are showing up a little bit at this point, but not really. Ivy is seen as kind of something different than jeans, even though in the U.S., the Ivy League campuses are all, uh, you know, people wearing jeans, especially from 65 on. So where do the Japanese jeans come from? Uh, the birthplace of jeans is this incredibly small town of Kojima and Okayama. And I think to Probably most of the people on this call, Kojima is really famous. I think to most people in Japan, it is not famous at all, other than being the birthplace of Japanese jeans. It's a pretty obscure manufacturing town uh, on the Inland Sea in the middle of nowhere. Um, and, uh, you know, what was going on there at the time was there was one company, uh, it was just, it was the big company in town called Maru Hifuku, and they were making uh, a lot of cold weather clothes and selling it to Maruseru over in uh, Amayoko. Um, but they're basically kind of making copies of American sturdy garments to wear, kind of for workwear and things like that. But their big business was school uniforms. And so they're doing huge school uniform sales. Um, but they're making it all from this one uh, fiber called uh, vinylon, which was a, a synthetic fiber. And it was really cheap and horrible. And the only place it's really used anymore is North Korea at the moment, to give you a sense of it. Um, and what happened was, the I think in the UK, they invented Tetaron, which is a much better nylon uh, kind of synthetic. And they were importing it to Japan, but the Kojima companies all got shut out of this. They couldn't make anything in Tetaron. So they're making all these Vinylon uh, uh, school uniforms, and nobody wants them, and their businesses are collapsing. And so Maro Hifuku is like, what are we going to do? Our business is collapsing. They go to uh, Dazaifu Tenmangu, which is this shrine to kind of get divine inspiration in a sense of what they should do. And they had been selling to Amayoko and the Amayoko people said, if you can make jeans, we can sell jeans because we can't get enough jeans and you make good stuff. I'm sure you could make jeans. So they go, great, let's make jeans. So the problem is 
there's no denim in Japan at this point. Nobody's making denim. All of the there's a huge textile industry, and it's all making silk and uh, very fine fabrics for export. So nobody's making anything close to denim, uh, and no one's spinning yarns for denim. So you got to import. You got to import it from the U.S. So they go through all these bureaucratic connections, and they figure out how to. Uh, import, get imported denim. So there's one company, Oishi Trading, that's got a contract with Canton Mills, which is a, a, was a denim mill in Georgia. And Oishi said, fine, we'll break you off some of the denim and you can make it for our brand, which was called uh, Canton. And so the problem is the denim arrives, they use their Japanese sewing machines and the needles break off because no one had ever had to sew something as thick as denim. So they got to import all these union special machines from the U.S., they realize they don't have the right buttons. They don't have rivets. The yellow, the kind of golden thread that's used in jeans, they don't have that. So they got to get all this stuff. So they import all the hardware and the fabric from the U.S. And finally, they can make a pair of jeans. And they make the Canton brand. So you see here, you've got some good, this actually pretty good English tag. Uh, and it's all from the Canton mills in Georgia. The fundamental problem, though, is that they're making raw denim in a market which still doesn't like raw denim, and so they have to start washing them. And so they also have to set up Japan's first denim wash uh, factory, and they are uh, doing one wash on these denim and trying to sell it. So the problem is now they've got to figure out how to sell jeans, because jeans aren't really uh, a big thing. And they go to Van Jacket, and Van Jacket says, look, just go to Isetan, and if Isetan will buy the, these uh, pants, you're good. And so Isetan looks at them, realizes they've been washed, and says, like, we don't sell washed merchandise, throws them on the floor, and more or less kicks them out of Isetan. So Big John then goes to Cebu, a rival department store, and Cebu says, look, we can't sell these either, but if you start a new brand that's a little bit more upscale, that's not just sold at military surplus shops, more or less, uh, we can maybe you know, do something. So they go back, they get a contract with Cone Mills, who sells, like basically selling the scraps of what Levi's done, doesn't want, shipping it to Japan. They make a brand called Big John. And Big John, as you see here, is very much selling this idea of American, you know, Western cowboy kind of aesthetics. And what's interesting here is that they don't really, it, it's very much posing as an American brand. So they're not selling necessarily, hey, we're a Japanese company making American clothing. They're trying to convince people more or less that this is an imported uh, uh, American brand called Big John. So they start doing ads. You see here, it's kind of getting a little bit more uh, countercultural as thing, time goes on. Um, and then something happens for them, which is that the student movement breaks out. So all these Marxist, Leninist, Maoist student groups are fighting police and conservatives, throwing Molotov cocktails and rioting. And the best thing you can wear when you're doing that is a pair of jeans. And so you'll see uh, on the right, the, the guy is wearing a pair of jeans while he riots. And so jeans start becoming the you know uniform for the leftists, uh, rioters. And uh, from there, you start finally getting a market for jeans in Japan. Then the hippie movement happens. You get people just copying U.S. styles. And so those kind of Japanese hippies also start dressing like American hippies and jeans uh, get in from there as well. Big John, which is, again, a company in Kojima, people who've never been to hate Ashbury start making all these ads of extreme hippies in the U.S. Um, and really selling the jeans as kind of the countercultural pants. By 72, the politics and all the really radical leftism of this protest movement uh, drops out, and then you get a kind of hippie movement that's non-political, and that helps them sell a lot more jeans. And then with the rise of bell bottoms, women start wearing jeans as well. And so as the bell bottoms come in, the market really doubles, and jeans are becoming ubiquitous. And so as you see here, you go from 2 million pairs in 66 to 45 million pairs in 73. So jeans at this point are just part of youth culture, massive success, and Big John is the leading brand. There's more brands at this point, Edwin, obviously. Um, Edwin was based in Tokyo, and Big John was over in Kojima. Um, but at this point, lots of brands, lots of people buying jeans. They're not rare anymore, and they're just part of youth culture. Okay, so that's jeans, though. So where does Japanese denim come from? Because at this point... Uh, Big John is still using comb mills and, uh, you know, everyone more or less is just using U.S. imported de uh, denim. So 
what had happened was in, uh, and this is a kind of a boring technical point, but an important one, which was the dollar was pegged to 360 yen, which made everything in Japan incredibly cheap and easy to export. And so all the textile factories in Japan were set up to export. So 90% of what it was being, being made in Japan was being exported. And suddenly in the Nixon administration, it starts floating and goes to 308 and then even less. And so everything in Japan starts getting really expensive and the export markets uh, starts to slow down. So t- denim, uh, sorry, the textile mills start saying, hey, we uh, need to develop a domestic market. And so they, a lot of these companies are close to the, the jeans companies and say, hey, we should just start making denim. At the same time, uh, you know, Big John is having a really hard time uh, uh, sourcing the American denim because of a bunch of strikes at mills and things like that. And so they think, look, we have, you know, Japan has this huge indigo dyeing tradition. Why don't we just make denim? And so uh, they go to Krabo, which was a spinning company that made the yarns and said, hey, can you figure out how to make denim? So Krabo kind of looked around um, and they found that the companies over in Hiroshima, which is not so far away, uh, the Dubingo Kasuri, which is a kind of traditional indigo dyeing, those companies were well set up to do things. Um, and so a company called Kaihara, which has been around for a long time, uh, it had just uh, found a huge amount of business selling these sarongs to the Middle East um, that were dyed indigo. But that all collapsed in 67, and now their business was kind of on the brink and trying to find a new business. They said, great, we'll figure out how to, to do denim for jeans. Um, as you may know, traditional Japanese indigo dyeing is all done by hand. It's very painstaking, but it makes really, really well dyed things that don't necessarily fade very much over time. But the problem with jeans is you want jeans to fade, and you need a more industrial process. So the Japanese at this point have to figure out how to make a worse dyeing uh, process than they have, and a much more you know quick, quick and easy one. So they figure out that rope dyeing is what uh, the the mills are using in uh, the U.S. So they set up their first rope dyeing factory, and Kaihara and Karabo make KD8, which is understood as Japan's first kind of attempt at a good denim, a 14 ounce denim. What I've heard is that this was not a 501 uh, copy; it was mostly trying to replicate the 505. Uh, denim, which was more popular at the time. And as soon as this was produced, it was actually good enough for Levi's Asia Pacific, which I think was being done out of Hong Kong. They ordered a bunch of this and started making Levi's in it as well. So from here on, you get this Japanese denim that's pretty good. um, And Big John is using it and producing a lot more and and denim kind of goes from there. Okay, but that's just kind of very, you know, uh, basic Japanese denim. It's being made. It's not salvage. It's being made on these big soldier uh, industrial looms. So where does the premium Japanese denim come from? And that, that starts a little later. And so one of the things that really s- starts it off is in 1975, this magazine comes out called Made in USA. And it makes everyone really obsessed with kind of traditional American goods. And on the cover is a pair of the 501. And the fit, you kind of get a sense of the fate of the 501. And people were like, why can't my Big John jeans made with Japanese denim get the same fade. And people just started obsessing with the 501 is the greatest gene of all time. We've got to get back to making that. And one of the things they realize that makes it different is that the denim has a selvage. And so obviously the denim mill, the mills, the textile mills in Japan knew what a selvage is. They have selvage looms. They're, they're made for sailcloth and things like that. But nobody was making denim on these selvage looms, more or less. And so they said, okay, let's make some selvage denim. It will make a really high quality pair that feels like an old 501. Um, and the word, sorry, the word for selvage in Japanese at the time was akamimi. So it's the it's referring to the red of the, the 501 uh, on the selvage. Um, and so you, you still kind of hear this word once in a while as a replacement for the word selvage. Um, and so Big John actually was the son of the founder of Big John, uh, decided he, he got really obsessed with making a premium pair of jeans so the Big John Rare came out. It was like, I think, three times the pair of a normal pair of Big John, uh, the price, three times the price of a normal pair of Big John. Uh, and it came out and it was the first salvage denim to really be sold in Japan and was a huge failure. And a lot of the salvage just kind of sat in a corner somewhere and nobody knew what to do with it. Meanwhile, we've been talking a lot about copying American style as the source of people getting into jeans. But in the early 80s, uh, 
French and Italian youth style got really big. And, and in France and Italy at the time, the 501 was really big there as well. And so as people were trying to copy Italian casual and French casual, they were uh, getting really into the 501. And one person who noticed that the 501 was very big in uh, in uh, France was a, a guy named Tangaki who was an assistant of a bunch of high fashion brands. And he came back to Osaka and said, if I can make a premium copy of the 501 i'm sure that's like you know like the original i'm sure these things will sell a lot you know overseas or everywhere and so he found a brand called studio darzan uh apparently they may have used some of that original denim for big john that was sitting around um but they they made a selfish denim jean um with the belt buckle on the back the leather patch and brought back a lot of these things that levi's had, had lost so these came out really expensive like 300 bucks and a complete failure, and everybody thought he was out of his mind, and these things would never catch on. So, meanwhile, uh, Carabo, that the people who first made denim, also realized there this kind of denim uh, uh, vintage denim boom is happening, and and they use a lot of really high tech processes to make what are called muraito, which are slubby denim. And so they make the slubby yarns, they make denim out of it, and so they start to want to sell this. And instead of selling it to Japanese brands, they say, let's sell it to French brands first. So they sell it to Chevignon and some, and I think, uh, Evu and like some of these French brands that were doing replica jeans in the mid 80s. Uh, and so in France, you start getting this Japanese denim showing up to make the perfect, you know, 501 uh, homage jeans. So one of these is hanging in a department store in France, and the head of Levi's Japan at the time sees it and says, wow, they're making this really great, you know, replica denim. Why don't we do that at Levi's? Comes back to Japan, figures out that actually that fabric was uh, from Krabo down, you know, in, in Japan, gets an exclusive contract for it and decides they're going to make Levi's first uh, vintage reproduction. So the first vintage reproductions Levi's ever, uh, ever does uh, is in the Japan office. And apparently they also went back and said, can you, you know, get Cone Mills, uh, to do another, you know, salvage denim because salvage at this point, I think it fall. I think eighty three, eighty four, salvage you know, is not using the five hundred one anymore. So they tried to get them to restart salvage, and Levi's manager in the U.S. is like, no way. So that's why they have to use the Japanese denim. Uh, but they they put this out. Hey, it's you know Levi's first vintage reproduction. And this was also a big failure, and people were not into it. And part of the reason that people were not into these replicas at the time was you could still more or less buy some dead stock jeans. So there was a huge movement of these uh, little stores going over to the U.S. without anyone in the U.S. knowing, going around the country, finding cheap dead stock uh, pairs of Levi's from the 60s that were just you know sitting around for $3, $4 a pair and going back to Japan and selling them for at first $200 to $300. Uh, and then by the time the 80s ends, you know, somewhere like Banana Boat, which is still around, uh, you're selling 66 model uh, Levi's 501s for $2,000, $3,000. And so the price, you know, goes astronomical. It's really, really hard to get your hands on the dead stock. So, you know, in the 80s, there was a resistance towards the premium denim, but the brands kept getting be better and better. And so Ebisu in over in Osaka tries to do their own replica brand in the early 90s. They've got the leather patch and the looser uh, waist. And as a joke, he paints kind of a parody of the Levi's uh, Arcuate Stitch uh, with uh, paint. And these just hit the market at the exact right time where people were saying, okay, if you can sell me a replica for 300, that's better than paying 3,000 for the dead stock. And so the market really starts for the reproduction brands and there's a huge boom for them. Uh, Yamane's assistant at Ebisu quits um, and starts full count because he thought that wasn't authentic enough. So they try to do an even more authentic gene. At the same time, they're doing a lot of innovation. So they're working with Zimbabwe and cotton, doing a long stable, uh, long stable cotton for the first time as uh, uh, denim. So you start really getting the innovation and the quality from here. Um, and so, you know, what what's kind of called the Osaka Five at this point are all putting out things. So that's um, the uh, Studio Torzan. Uh, Denim, Evisu, Full Count, and um, uh, Warehouse. And so they're all kind of doing, you know, either modern adaptation of the reproduction or, uh, in the case of Warehouse, really, really uh, hardcore reproduction brands. At the same time, there's another vector going on. So um, uh, Mr. Hirata, who founds the brand Capital, uh, 
and capital was in Kojima, so it actually is a Kojima company, starts to work uh, with first Hollywood Ranch Market and then 45 RPM on how do you make a really nice uh, vintage feel to the denim that kind of comes out. And from here on, both 45 RPM and Hollywood Ranch Market are obsessed with the kind of Japanese-ness of it. So they start not just selling it as, hey, this is an American perfect copy of the 501 or the American jeans, but almost this uh, very distinctly um, Japanese craft garment. And a lot of that comes out of the brand that later became Capital and the people behind that. Now, what's quite interesting is as you get to around 2005, that Japanese jeans uh, are not just kind of copies of American jeans, but really sort of merging as their own genre of jeans. They're just a different thing and a much more high quality premium thing. And so with Blue and Green opening in New York and then Self Edge opening uh, in, in multiple locations, you start getting stores that are literally just dedicated to selling this and explaining it to people. And this was, uh, you know, Ebisu was very big around the, the turn of the century. Uh, and then these stores really helped establish the, uh, the the idea of Japanese denim being premium and it being its own kind of unique uh, sub subgenre. Meanwhile, in Japan, what's quite interesting is Kojima, you know, was really tied to Big John and some of these big manufacturers, but with uh, the collect uh, denim mill that kind of started there and the textiles, you start getting the smaller brands like Momotaro, and then from Momotaro, starting to rebrand the entire city based on the history of its uh, role in in making jeans happen. And so from there, Kojima is rebranded as the holy land of jeans. Uh, and it's a really impressive project they did. They, like this, this um, place that uh, was not considered, you know, you had to really, really know your history to understand this. They've, they've totally made it the, the jeans capital of, of the country, uh, based not necessarily on the denim being made there, but by the jeans being sewed there for the first time. And a lot of the sewing factories are still there as well. Um, you can see here they've got a, a salvage looking um, a line on on Jean Street. Um, but you know the Momotaro and those brands uh, related to it have been you know instrumental in in having this happen. And then finally, just to kind of another summary point of how Japanese this American garment became, you've got a brand called Samurai Jeans with all the names like Yamato and Samurai. Um, and uh, it's just seamless at this point. And I think that it, you have to stop to remember once in a while the jeans aren't a Japanese traditional uh, garments. They actually only are, you know, 70 years old as in terms of people wearing them and only, you know, maybe three or four decades of Japanese denim being something that is uh, valued. Um, so I kind of wanted you know, to take away two main lessons from this whole story. Um, obviously, you know, if you're interested in Japanese denim, all those details hopefully are interested, but interesting. But these two are kind of the bigger ones, which uh, are that I think Japan is, has been able to reinvent itself in the 21st century as kind of the global center of craftsmanship and, and production. Um, so you see this in something like whiskey. Um, if you're into Naples style pizza, uh, there's, you know, four or five people just obsessed with it in Japan who are battling them out to make the most authentic pizza. But as the rest of the world, and especially the United States, has lost its manufacturing base and lost this kind of spirit of making things better instead of just cheaper, um, Japan has branded itself as the place where that is still happening across everything. So it doesn't matter necessarily if it's a traditional Japanese thing or a traditional American thing. Japan makes the best of all things. And, and I do think that has played a huge role in the tourism boom in Japan and, and, and kind of rebranding Japan after its, you know, economic rise and fall as a place that still matters uh, quite a bit to the culture. And what's related to that is this idea of authenticity. And so I think authenticity really matters to a lot of people. I think people in this call uh, really care about buying authentic jeans and, and the production methods being authentic, but authenticity used to be what's called the authenticity of origin, which meant that if, you know, pasta is Italian, then the best pasta has to come from Italy. And if jeans are American, the best jeans must come from America. But now we're in an era that I think that, that the Japanese have helped really create, which is the authenticity of production. And so if the method you use to make something is authentic, if it's related to uh, the original uh, better than what is being made in that new, in the, you know, origin, then that is the thing that is most authentic. And so Japanese jeans are, um, you know, they've, they've, I think probably people on this 
call, will argue about this, but you know, a lot of times they're seen as these are the most authentic pairs of Japanese genes, or the Japanese denim is the most authentic denim because it's closer to 1930s or 1940s American denim than what's being made in the United States. And I, as far as I know, there's very little denim even being made in the United States anymore at all. And so this uh, authenticity of production is something I think we're going to see, you know, in the next hundred years that it, it just doesn't matter where it's made as long as it's made in the original methods. Um, so that's it. If you read the book, if you haven't read the book, um, it's got way more detail on everything I just said and a lot more probably accurate dates than I just said, because I can never quite remember them. Uh, but um, I, we now have some time. I think we have 20 minutes. I'm happy to, to answer any questions. And uh, thank you again for having me. We just need you to unmute yourself, Dom. Uh, I've just got a quick question before Tom throws a few questions at you that have been sent in. Uh, let me have a look. Where are you? You're here. David, can you just let people know where they can get the book from, please? Depending on where they are based in the world. Um, it's really Amazon. You know, it's one of those times when you want to say support your local independent bookseller. Um, but it's often just not in stores. I think writing a, a book that's a history of, of fashion that's mostly words is a, is a hard sell for uh, booksellers to know where to stock it. I'll go to somewhere in the fashion section and it's just all photo books. And so Amazon is usually your best bet. Um, but if you can find it at your local store, definitely support your local store. Is there, is there a way that uh, any denim stores can get in touch with you in case they want to stock? I mean, is it, is it possible for a small or independent denim store to just maybe buy 10 and have in yeah, stock? Sure. You, know, you know, how do they do that? Yeah, one of the, it's now, the, the publisher is part of Hachette and they've got um, pretty good distribution offices around the world. So uh, you can email me through the Global Denim Hang, hopefully, and um, I'll try to set you up with the distributors. Lovely. Um, over to you, Tom, if you're going to do a few questions, bud. I've seen a few being typed. Can anybody else hear Tom? No. Well, Tom, I'll just leave you to get your audio sounded out, mate, and I'll uh, I'll fire him with Will's. Uh, Will Barnum, our good friend, Rook Style, has asked a good question for you, David. He's put an amazing presentation. Thank you very much, David. Where does Japanese denim go next, in your opinion? What do you think we might see in the next five to ten years? I think it's really hard when you ask the big brands, you know, they're still thinking at a really mass scale. Um, and so they probably have very different opinions than people on this call, which is we're looking for um, very specific innovations on the premium side, where a lot of them are still trying to figure out how to do the mass mass. Uh, things. I think it's really quite interesting that Uniqlo came out with the uh, selvage denim a couple of years ago that I believe Kaihara was making the selvage and then they were shipping it to China to uh, actually sew and then shipping it back to Japan in order to cut costs. Um, but I don't know whether that's really a model that's going to be uh, normal. I think the number one thing that I will say is just that the Japanese denim market started in the 90s as a uh, market for Japanese companies to sell to Japanese consumers. And so the people who were buying it were more or less Japanese consumers. With Ebisu, you really saw, uh, you know, through kind of Hong Kong and England and then the U.S., you saw it go global a little bit. But um, now, you know, it's not just that these Japanese brands are, are exporting to the rest of the world. Um, but the, also, when you looked in, you know, before Corona, if you went to Harajuku or something or any of these stores, you know, most of the customers were not Japanese, especially if you in Harajuku. And that's like a really big change in Japanese fashion, which is that Harajuku used to be a place for Japanese kids to show up. And now it's mostly a place for foreign tourists to buy the clothes. And so, you know, that's going to have an effect on the brands. And so, it, you know, the tastes of the foreign consumers who are going to be more and more the consumer is going to shape them a little bit. But at the same time, I think a lot of these brands are pretty stubborn in the sense about they're going to make what they think is best and they're going to keep up their own traditions at this point. And so it may it may be that Japanese brands don't necessarily you know, innovate in the sense they just keep making what they're making better and better. 
Um, and hopefully the global market just continues so they can still do that. I mean, it's, uh, it's really important that people are willing to pay as much for a pair in order for them to have the, you know, more or less market to justify doing all the, the crazy manufacturing techniques that they use. Uh, and, you know, the flathead was one where, you know, we've got a, uh, a factory that only makes the pocket and the factory that only makes belt, belt loops and all those kind of things, you know, and the flathead seemed to have gone out of business and now it's back or whatever, but it's, you know, really important just that as long as people are paying for it, that I think they'll, they'll just keep doing great stuff. And that's what I hope to see in the next 10 years, but I don't know if you're going to see something necessarily different. Uh, just following on from that, we've got a question actually from uh, a gentleman called Brian, which is slightly manufactured, manufacturing related. So I'll, I'll throw this one at you next. Uh, during your research, did you encounter many slash any makers that fit the kind of stereotype you described at the beginning of the talk, an aged maker bent over an old shuttle loom? If not, why do you think that image is such a lasting one? A brand's capitalizing on this. Um. In general, no, I have not seen that. I think that there's maybe for all of these companies, a tiny aspect of it, you know, is being done by real kind of, um, you know, ancient craftspeople working in, in certain ways. But most of it is uh, man, either mass manufacturing or, you know, mechanized manufacturing or however you want to call it. I think the brands are very smart, though, and they know to tie it to... Um, Japanese tradition and craftsmanship. And, you know, some of it is, I think they're, um, you think a brand like Levi's or Cone Mills or America and the image of America is big mass manufacturing and you don't consider it. And I think Japanese brands are very smart about understanding what people want out of Japan and what people want out of Japan isn't mass manufacturing and, ro and robotic built things. They want craftsmanship at this point. And so those brands are capitalizing on it. The fact that you think about the, you know, 85 year old person, um, you know, hunched over a loom in when you think of your denim is a really big, uh, I would say, proof point of their success, which is they've made you think that's it. Um, that being said, I went, this was probably 15 years ago, so I don't know what it's like now, but someone said, oh, go talk to these. Um, they're the, some of the best sewers in Japan. They do come to Garçon and a lot of these brands. And I went to the, the factory that's in East Tokyo, and it was just literally just a room. And it was two brothers who were about 65. And then their mother, who was 85, and it's just the three of them doing all of it. Um, and that that is that is real. You know, that, that was a real thing. But, you know, 15 years later, I just I can't imagine the mother's alive and I don't know what they're doing. I mean, it didn't seem like there was any um, apprentices who were going to take it over. So, you know, the other problem with this is just how long can it last where you have 85 year olds? Um, well, we've all, heard, we've, we've all heard the story, haven't we, that uh, everybody that makes this salvage denim is. 85 year old and no, no, no younger people are learning how to do it and it's going to get rid, you know. So what we're saying is basically a lot of that is marketing. It, do, it does give it that, it does give the image of the gene, of the denim, a romantic uh, story. Yeah, and I think that, you know, someone, someone like Kai Hara does it really well, which is that they have a wing that is their, you know, they've got a big room of all the salvage looms. Um, that was off limits and I couldn't see it, but um, then they've got, you know, a totally roboticized factory that's quite high tech and, and amazing. And so, you know, this, I think the smart brands can balance both. And, and I think it's also important for everybody to know that just because it's not an 85 year old man, <laughs> it don't mean that we're getting ripped off. <laughs> you know, these, these factories, everything is still built to the best quality I mean, and what have you. I don't know if you can, <laughs> can people hear me now? Is it better now? You take over, but if you yeah. take over. I mean, yeah, people are, people get older in Japan than in a lot of other places, but I think at 85, they do stop working though. So, you know, it, it kind of doesn't make logical sense even. But uh, but yeah, okay, so we got some more questions. Some, a really good one here from Casper White. Um, do you see globalization diluting the Japanese uh, absorption of other international trends. Japan used to be so exotic to travel to, but now it's uh, so much more accessible. Yeah, this is a big, uh, big thing to think about. I think, I think it's actually a little bit more complicated, which is that Japan was very hungry for foreign things uh, after the war up until recently. And so then you've got people 
going to Naples to learn how to be, you know, a pizza cook or to be a tailor and to learn all that because they're obsessed with Italian tailoring or they're going, uh, you know, and building brands in the U S that use American manufacturing or whatever, but you know, it's because they're obsessed with it and they can't quite get their hands on it themselves in Japan. But the generation after, you know, you can grow up and you can have a perfectly authentic Italian pizza and, you know, go get a perfectly tailored Italian suit and have a pair of jeans that's better than what you get in the U S and at some point there's just really no desire to go overseas and to learn these things. And so I do think there's a real generational divide in Japan of everybody who's you know under 40 just is just has less kind of interest or less you know passion about going overseas and, and bringing in those things back. And so you get a little bit of uh, cultural stasis at the moment. I just don't think there's been as much innovation. I think Japan right now, uh, you know, again, before Corona, just huge tourism. It's really good for the country. Like I have no, no complaints about um, to see that the economy is feels feels vibrant in Tokyo when the, when there are so many tourists. But at the same time, I think tourists are there to consume kind of Japan's '90s, not necessarily now. And if you think about that, um, it seems so, somewhat sad that Japan's not necessarily innovating new things. The way I, I would say Korea is innovating a lot of new stuff, um, and China's probably next. But uh, if you think of Italy, you know, I keep going to Italy, but like Italy is a model in the sense of people aren't like, did you see this thing that was invented in Italy in 2015? It's the greatest thing ever. You know, everyone is still obsessed with Italy in the 1950s and Vespa scooters and Italian cuisine and Italian tailoring. And it's a real, you know, culture tradition. And I think Japan has its own, you know, ancient traditions. And then it has a set of these kind of modern traditions like denim, I would say, that people are there to consume. And so um, it is. You're at a point now where, yes, like it is not somewhere that everything's rare anymore, but um, it's great to see these brands find an audience from overseas when their domestic audience kind of collapsed on them. Um, and at the same time, I've not seen them adjust that much to the uh, foreign consumers. I think they really care about making a product they, they want to make and they just continue to do it. So um, I don't worry about the dilution of Japanese culture, but I do worry that. Uh, it's a little bit frozen. Mm -hmm. All right. So I think uh, we got around nine, eight minutes left and um, a couple more questions here. Uh, just a quick one here. Tom Berg is asking, what's your favorite brand? And I'm assuming jeans brand. So For dinner, uh, one that, that's a little bit um, left field and it's kind of hard to get out of Japan. There's a brand called Tsuki. It's T-U-K-I. Um, and uh, the guy who does it, uh, Harada, is... He's a kind of denim junkie who's be beyond the replica thing. And so I think he really wanted to figure out how can I make a pair of jeans that's a great pair of jeans, but doesn't really, you know, just uh, just try to kind of hear the traditions. I'm just going to do them. And so famously, I, I got to talk about in the book, he's got, you know, not he intentionally uses non-selvage. I saw yesterday he had a pair that I bought. Um, which is selvage, but then he actually stitches over it, you know, which like nobody does just to kind of be a, a little bit of a, a prankster. And so I, uh, but it's so minimal, it's so stripped down. And I, I like that quite a bit, just, and it shows the um, breadth of, you can have the manufacturing quality and the really fo focus on really great uh, material. He works with Kaihara a lot. He does his own special dyes. Like he'll find the exact shade of green that they used to dye military pants in Japan in the 50s, and we'll use that. So it's still that, but the final product isn't just to make a perfect copy of it. It's to, to do something a little bit more avant-garde and new. So um, that's for T-U-K-I. If you can find it, it's um, it's a super fun brand. Nice. So um, I think we got time for a last question here, and uh, it's also a good one to end with. It's David from the new Sons of Selvage podcast that's out. And... Um, David says, uh, love the book. Will we see companion books in the future that expand upon uh, or tell similar narratives to what is in Amatora? Um, from me, uh, there's kind of two things happening. So one, I'm, I am writing a new book that is a little bit more, uh, I think the word theory always sounds scary and no one wants to read a book about theory. But what I'm trying to do is look at the process of how things become trends and how uh, things spread. Um, that I, I deal with an amateur, like how things uh, become status symbols, how they move through the media, how they move from you know one place to another, um, and doing a book 
uh, that I'm writing at the moment. I got to turn it in next June. So hopefully it'll be out uh, 2022 at this point. Uh, but that book kind of covers, it, it looks at um, the role of, of status, like how people seek out status and how that builds up culture and explains fashion and uh, fashion, art, classes, taste, subcultures, um, retro media, kind of everything. So I'm trying to make one book that kind of explains how trends and, and culture work because I I felt a little frustrated with, you know, this is the topic I'm really interested in. I felt frustrated that there's not one book that kind of covers all of that. So working on that at the moment, there's also something I recommend is um, there's a book that is impossible to get uh, that's called Today There Are No Gentlemen. And it was written in 1971 by a rock critic named Nick Cohn. And what he does is he looks at the history of uh, British fashion from the post-war to about 1970. And it I had not read it until after I finished Amatora, but it's eerie. It's just like, it's the same format. So he interviews the exact people who brought in mod style or, you know, skinheads or, you know, all of that. And he looks at it and it's really funny and really smart. Uh, and since it's pretty close to the changes, he really gets into the nitty gritty of why things change. That book goes for about, I think, like $1,000 a copy or something. It's really hard to find. It's out of print. And so I was getting frustrated with it being out of print, and I can't do anything about that in English, but I thought I could do something about it in Japanese. And so uh, I worked with my publisher in Japan to get the rights, and we are um, coming out with it next month, actually, in Japanese. So there's going to be the first Japanese translation of Today There Are No Gentlemen, um, which I will we'll talk a little bit more about. So if you're a Japanese speaker, this is great. If you're not, you know, get, try to get the book or a PDF or something, because it's quite fascinating if you like that story uh of you know how 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 fashion trends come about and then you know i hope i really hope the format of amateur is one that people use to write cultural history i think cultural history is really exciting but often it's just like things happen uh or this happens and then this happens and i um i think histories are boring when you do that i think history is really interesting when you realize that people are at uh, dilemmas at any point and they're trying to make they're just trying to solve problems like my business is failing what do i do um, when you go backwards and say, you know, Kaihara makes great denim, well, of course they make great denim. But if you start from like where Kaihara was in 1967, they had a great business of dyeing sarongs for the Arab world that fell apart. And now they got to find a new business. And someone says, how about dyeing denim? And say, great, let's dye some denim. And then they go forward from there. And so I think when you, when you write history, um, just to be able to go through people's choices and to follow those choices rather than to kind of just tell it where I call kind of the Bible problem where it's just like this happened and then this happened and this happened. It's incredibly boring. So I, I do hope that you can, you know, write about any topic in the world, but use the same kind of cultural take, same writing style, which is to interview people, understand their choices, understand what could have been and why they, they made things the way they are. Cause they're usually just way less intentional than you would think. Amazing. Great. All right, Ben. Uh, yeah, <laughs> David, thank you very much for your time. Uh, uh, thanks for opening up the uh, the Global Denim Hang for us. It's been uh, really informative, very interesting. Uh, just before we quickly move on and I get speaking to Brother Bazard over at Naked and Famous, if anybody wants to uh, get in touch with you personally is, is there a specific email or Instagram or Twitter account or website you would like them to do that by you? Uh, follow me on Instagram. My DMs are more or less open. so just And that's neo-Marxism, right? Yeah, sorry. I don't, I don't make it easy for people. So uh, <laughs> uh, let me, I'll type it in the chat. <laughs> that's good uh, right so in the next couple of minutes David thank you very much sir thank you very much are you sticking around for a bit um, I may I, it's, it's getting late here in Japan so I gotta probably get to some family stuff but thanks fair do fair do uh, thank you for your time so yeah just to remind everybody this has been streamed live on YouTube if you're watching it on YouTube please uh, click like and subscribe. It does help us a lot. And we are trying to raise money for charity alongside this event, and it's all relevant. Uh, if you want to enter the raffle, there is pushing 40 prizes now, uh, value well over £5,000. Uh, I think we've done around 160 tickets. Uh, I think we can double that over the next 24 hours easily. Uh, so yeah, uh, the link to the raffles in my bio, 
And if you're watching on YouTube but want to come on Zoom, go to globaldenimand.com and that will give you the Zoom link. If you're on Zoom and you want to watch on YouTube, go to globaldenimand.com.